Hello everyone and welcome to this weekend's meeting Sana Lidmaruku speaking. I am Shubhi Sana heading the youth wing of Rationalist International. Um as you all know that we have linked our Zoom, YouTube and Clubhouse together so I welcome all of you. Uh now you can ask questions through any of these platforms and we are happy to welcome all of you who have been participating in our meetings for so many years now. Uh the meeting will be the same as before. Sana Lidmaruku would present his thoughts on the topic for 60 minutes followed by him answering any questions or doubts the participants might have. Uh so I would request uh, Sana Lidmaruku to begin with his uh session and I'm looking forward for it. Shubhi thank you very much and now um I think we can start the session. First of all the basic question that a lot of people ask who are on the verge of coming out of religion would be very simple what if i come out of religion what would happen to me what would be the society speaking what would be the family reacting to and how i would feel myself one is a wavering one is on the on the bridge unsure and in the classical words of matlin murray if you take the non believers in the closet many of them are so afraid to come out because they are convinced about their position but they are not convinced about the possible social ostracism the social isolation at least in many societies which are conservative wherein there is a lot of fear you would be isolated if you come out would be following you in countries like united states of america two or three decades back it was assessed that half of the people or more than half of the people who identify themselves as atheists in their personal life would not come out and speak about it if you remember there is a very famous clipping of a movie which is in circulation everywhere i mean i don't remember the name of the movie but the few sentences that a mother and daughter are in a they are in a conversation and the mother is so unhappy about the daughter for something because she is a teenager and not very very much in tune with mother's ideas then the mother asks her are you an atheist you don't accept many things that we value are you an atheist she said oh no 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 i'm not an atheist but do you believe in a god no i don't believe in a god because the term atheist was so scary for people to accept even in united states of america some decades back and that was what was symbolized in this very famous movie clipping i mean about which i've heard uh, i mean christopher hitchens has been speaking about he when he was very actively speaking about anti theism he was speaking about this small clipping that's why this was in circulation also later i heard richard dawkins speaking about the same story that how people are afraid to use terms like atheist there were discussions by many people why shouldn't we use some other term some people suggested why not some other term like bright or i mean to to mask your identity because you are simply afraid but leaving aside i'm not speaking about the fear that many people have to come out but i'm speaking about the real issues that you have in your mind when you think you would like to leave religion and you would like to be a free person i didn't go through that but i know what was happening in hundreds of people's mind or thousands of people's mind because i've been witnessing the transformation of a lot of people throughout my career in the rationalist movement in india and later in europe also one major thing that i found for those people who are brought up in a religious family or in a religious community or society and when they realize that well all the beliefs are baseless that they have been following all these years but how do i come out what would my parents speak of? i mean react to it what would be my relatives maybe one has a spouse and the views are not discussed yet so how would one speak out and what would be the reaction so you have a clear position but you are unsure whether you can speak it out because you are simply afraid of the possible consequences but this is the first hindrance that many of the non believers in closet would face and that's the point we generally suggest those people 
who are actually non-believers, who are actually out of religion in their mind, who are atheists, that they have to think for themselves and speak honestly about their position because that will give you a lot of strength. You would realize the moment you speak out your mind that you are a strong person because you are no more afraid to speak your mind, your conscience, your, your worldview. And suddenly you would realize that the fear that you had was just imaginary because there may be some fanatics who may be disliking what you speak, but many of the people whom you were thinking would be against you would simply take it so light because the number of non-believing people all around the world are growing so fast and people are exposed to this idea that there are a lot of people who are non-believers. Except in repressed societies like in Saudi Arabia or in Iran or countries like that where if you speak that you are an atheist, you would be punished with death. Everywhere you see tangible evidence, documented figures that show that the non-believers are systematically growing in their numbers. Exceptions are there. I mean, I, I would not, um, the, in, in Europe, in most of the countries, at least in most of the countries, the situation is very, very promising. I mean, there are exceptions like Poland. That's something very, very different. But I can tell my experience when I came to Finland to live here some 10 years back. I saw the first church goer two years after reaching Finland. I could not see a single church goer. I've gone to a church along with one of my friends who was the ambassador of India to see a concert. And uh, interestingly, I was looking at the people there. There were some 15 people there, most of them above 60 years, even though it was a concert, which was a good program, but people were not interested in the institution of the church or the, the structure that are connected with the church. Nobody is against the church, but people lost their interest in church. That's one thing. I mean, Hall of Scandinavia or Nordic are a very different model of, uh, you know, people leaving the religion and, um, I mean, moving towards non-belief. But in other parts of the country, I mean, world, in United Kingdom, for example, recently there was a survey. They have an annual figures taken by several, uh, I mean, agencies like the Gallup and all. But every 10 years, they make a census. The last census that was for 2020 came out last year, 21 came out, and the figures were so promising. The number of non-believers have systematically gone up, and the number of the faithful people in, who consider themselves religious that has declined so heavily. And the people leaving Christianity, the people who are leaving, their number has unbelievably 17% declined. This is something amazing. And the, the more interesting details of this survey is available now. The census is available. It's available online. It's a public document. You can verify it. If you take the people under the age of 40, more than 50% of the people in UK are non-believers. They are officially identifying them as non-believers. More than 50%. Many countries and many churches would claim their number is very high, but they are in Europe, for example, something like Eurobarometer, which is something very reliable document, which shows the level of belief or cultural identity as belief that people follow. And the figures are very, very promising in most of the countries that we know. For example, in Estonia, Lithuania, or in Czech Republic, Finland, Sweden, Norway, all these countries show a very promising number. But not only here. I mean, one of the biggest populations that we have in the whole world would be India, China, and Brazil. So India, I have very close figures, I mean, available with me. The, every 10 years, there is a Gallup uh, study about the number of people who believe, follow any religion. And 1991, they had a figure available. That was the first time I came in contact with these figures because I was interviewed by some television channels at the time because 7% of the Indian population identified as non-believers or not believing in any kind of God. 
7%. The question that the televisions asked me at that time was very simple. They said, you have been working the rationalist movement, was active here for more than 50 or 60 years now, but only 7% of Indian population have left religion. Probably they left not with, with your work, but other ways also. How do you comment about that? I, I answered very clearly. The, it's not the atheist organizations and atheist or rationalist organizations that push people out of religion, but people do it themselves. We are only an, a, a force that something like accelerates that process. We help people when they're puzzled. We give the intellectual fuel for them to strengthen themselves. That's what we are doing. It's not our direct responsibility. We are missionaries, not missionaries. We are not people who are going around and converting people, but we encourage people to think for themselves and help them if they have a problem and try to find an identity for them without being persecuted by others. But this 7% is very important because India has a large Christian population, which is closest to the, the Catholic population in Germany because it's a huge country and large population nearly 1.8% or 2% of Christians is a small number by percentage, but the actual number is very, very heavy, very high. Christians are less than 2% and the Sikhs are around 1.2% and the Jains are 1%, the Buddhists are around 1%. It's a pluralist society, though the majority are Hindus and uh, the Muslims are under 20%. But if you take the combined population of the Christians and the Sikhs and the Jains and the Buddhists, the non-believers who are officially identified as non-believers are large. It's a large number than the collective figure of all these people. But we are not a religion. We are not organized. We are not trying to make something like a church would do. But we have our voice and there are much more people who are actually atheists, who are actually non-believers, who are afraid of the society and who cannot come out because they are simply afraid of the consequences. So, but that was in 1991 was the the calculation year and the results came in 1993. So 10 years later, the figures came up to 9%. And 2011's figure was available now. That is already 13%. It's growing in a society which we all look with great skepticism that it is going towards a kind of a closer to a religious state. But the number of non-believers are growing there systematically. And or more and more people are courageous enough to come out of religion. And if my calculations go correctly and if the the trends are evaluated correctly one can very well see that in next 10 years the number of atheists or non-believers in India would surpass the number of Muslims in India and that would make the second biggest uh, I I mean position in connection with faith in the whole of India. That's not a small thing for a population of 1.3 billion people. It's a huge number when you think the whole number of India. For example, I live in Finland now. Though most of my activities are still in India, the Finnish population is something like uh, 5.4 million people. It's something like, how do you calculate? I mean, I generally try to compare it with the Indian population. I was born in a state in southern India named Kerala. It's one of the smallest states in India. How would you calculate the size of Kerala? Indian parliament has 540 members and each parliamentary constituency is based on the population of people in that area. Out of these 540 people, Kerala has only 20 people. Such a small state. And that was my mother tongue, which is Malayala, which is not even known to many people in other parts of the world. But I always thought that, hmm, what a small language I am speaking. It's only something like 30 million people speaking this language. I mean, in India, in the whole population is so huge that I felt this is such a small language. It's a very rich language. I mean, it's a modern language. And uh, Kerala ha- has some other specialities also. It has one of the largest non-believing organizations. Atheist rationalist movement is very active there. It's the first state in India which became 100% literate, birth rate gone down. I mean, it's very different. But... It's a small language, it's a small population, 
But as compared to other countries, like 1.4 million people in Estonia or 5.4 million people in Finland, I mean, these are countries which are taken because they are countries, I mean, these are nations, their positions are taken very big. So since India is one big country and all these small units are taken part of the country, the size of the non-believing community in India is not seen exactly. Same is the case with Brazil. Brazil is not actively seen elsewhere because, I mean, of the language, it's not an English-speaking language or a French-speaking area. Uh, it's speaking kind of Portuguese language. So it's uh, a little bit difficult for people who are speaking other languages to come into the culture, but we have very close contacts with the people in, in Brazil. The non-believing community in Brazil is growing systematically up. China, the figures we cannot really uh, evaluate or estimate because of the political system there. But in any way, the number of people who follow religion, there are not very high, very clearly. So what I wanted to say is that it's a huge population who are non-believers. You are not isolated somewhere as a small pocket. So that doesn't make any sense. I mean, even if you are the last lone person who has a very clear view about things, you need not be afraid and you should be able to speak about yourself. But all the same, don't think that you are a small minority somewhere. You are part of a huge, big community scattered in hundreds of different organizations trying to cooperate each other, trying to work together. And whenever there are issues, people are helping each other. And I mean, that's how it is. And it's a huge community of people building up their strength all around the world based on common sense, reason, tolerance, and the values of science and a humane value system. That's the fundamental core value of the non-believing community. Because the value system is not based on any revelation. The value system is not based on any holy text. It's based on our own understanding about our civilization, our own evaluation about our civilization and our values, with our own experience of wars and conflicts and what we studied, and the basis of scientific understanding. And this new value system, which is getting evolved and progressively growing practically, is the foundation of the whole non-believing community. So the first fear that many people have is that, what if I leave religion? Will I lose all the values that are connected with religion as per many people's position? In fact, the kind of values that these religions try to claim as their own has nothing to do with our value system now. These religions, for example, if you take Judaic religion or Christianity or Islam, I would come to Hinduism and Buddhism and the Sramanika religions differently because it has a different different structure. These old religions have their own value system coming from very past. They have modified, the people have modified, but the religious texts have not modified. It cannot be modified because these are really revealed knowledge. If you go to the value system of Bible, there will be a lot of interesting questions coming. Will you take the value system coming from the Old Testament with an angry Jehovah who would burn cities because he doesn't like the homosexuals there? Or will you take a very angry God punishing eternally to, for people to have their painful birth or, or delivery because they have eaten the forbidden fruit for coming generations and generations? Not only humans, but even animals will have painful I mean, delivery or when, when the, the, the birth would be a, a painful experience because somebody has done something wrong. So what is wrong and right was based on a lot of different ideas. And if you take even the modern worldview, which many of the new Christians would say, starting from Jesus Christ, well, still there are a lot of interesting questions one would ask, which Jesus Christ you would take? The Jesus Christ who has taken, I mean, if you take the Sermon of the Mount, which you can find the source, I mean, in pre-Christian I mean, history also, or the Jesus Christ who would go to the temple with a whip and beat people and ask for violence. I mean, there are different faces of all these characters. But what's the value system these religions are actually giving? It's a false claim 
that they are the custodians of the value system. In fact, when you go deeply or a little closer to the real situation, you simply understand that your value system or the core value system that's existing in the society now is not connected with any religion. It has evolved. It has improved. And there, was a there were efforts at many times to stabilize it. For example, new values came. The idea of freedom was not considered as a value in any of these holy texts. The idea of tolerance was not considered as a value in any of these texts. The idea of uh, the concept of democracy was not considered as a value for the ruling system anywhere. This all came later. So the, the fundamental values, I mean, that we generally accept universally has been systematically codified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You reach through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you can simply see that the majority of them are against the foundations of the value system of all these religions. But I, why I didn't speak about the, the Indian religions or the Sramanika religions generally. What is Sramanika religion is that kind of religion which is not believing in a hell and heaven, but on a cycle of rebirth, like Buddhism, Jainism, or there was another religion, namely Ajivaka religion, which is not very, very much popular now. It's almost extinct. But three, these three major religions we are generally considered which has a different value system, which advocated to an extent tolerance. But also, you have seen that they have also adopted the, the kind of intolerance of all other religions, which is very well seen in many parts when these religions are in control of the political power. Hinduism, as of there is no Hinduism, there was no religion namely Hinduism, till a few centuries back. There was a name called to the people that was used to identify the people who lived beyond the Indus River. Those people who are not Christians, who are not Muslims, who are not Parsis, the Saratustans also came to India at the time. They were called collectively Hindus later, but it was a different kind of religion coming from the past with a kind of hierarchical caste system and they never considered as one religion. That's a new political phenomenon and it does not have one single value system. Every single form of Hinduism has a different value system and different faith system. And for example, if you are a Hindu in India, how would you leave the Hindu religion? It's very difficult normally, one would say. For example, if you believe in God as Kali, who would destroy the enemies by killing them and drinking their blood, you are a Hindu. If you believe in God, Vishnu, still you are a believer. You are part of Hinduism. Vishnu has several incarnations like Ram and Krishna and all these kinds of people. And many people worship all these different people. There is a goddess for wealth. There is a goddess for letters. There is a goddess for dirty tricks. I mean, all, all different kinds of gods or goddesses are there all around. There are 36 million gods, as it is officially claimed. And you can worship any of them still you are taken as part of Hinduism. But if you don't believe in any of these gods and you say that these deities are just symbols of their faith and I don't believe in any of these things, I believe in a universal spirit only, still you are a Vedanti and you are a Hindu. So how can you come out? If you don't go to a temple, you reject all the idol worship and idolatry, then you are a Vedanti. You believe in a different kind of Hinduism. So once I met a top Hindu leader who was the Home Minister of India, the, the Hindu Radical Party, BJP's uh, Home Minister. When I was a journalist in Delhi, I had a meeting with him, L.K. Adwani. I um, mean, he was uh, in a way instrumental in building up the Hindu Radical Movement in India. So during the conversation, I said, I mean, he asked, I mean, you are from Kerala. Most of the Keralites are Christians, right? I said, that's again a wrong idea. Most of the Keralites are not Christians. Most of the Keralites are non-believers. That's the correct answer. Secondly, even the believers, if you take, I mean, they are around 20% of the Kerala population. I mean, if you take by birth, how people are coming from. But I am certainly an atheist. Oh, then he said, then you are a Hindu. I said, how? Uh, because an atheist is a Hindu, because all atheist scholars of the past were all absorbed into Hinduism. So I'm very happy that to see a Hindu atheist. 
I said, I, I differ on that point. I would not want to be a Hindu. <laughs> I, I would like to be an independent person without any religion. Come on, you are a Hindu. He started kind of poking and insisting on me being a Hindu. I mean, still in meetings, when I discuss with people, I mean, interestingly, on television, still I am very active. When I attack any Hindu faith system, the others would immediately, you know, the people on the other side, they would say that hmm, you have a, a Christian background. Therefore, that is why you are criticizing Hinduism. That's a kind of easy defense there. I mean, or can you criticize Christianity and Islam also? Most of the people think that those who people who criticize religion are only criticizing Hinduism. In fact, I have been active on all these fronts. When my life in Finland, when I moved from India to Finland, one of the reasons, major reason was my own personal security because I've exposed a miracle in Mumbai, which is in a Catholic church. I mean, that is another story, which, well, I don't have to explain all these things to all these people, but it's very difficult to leave Hinduism in India. That's one of the major issues that many people face. It's, you can, there is no... A regular list of, I mean, the followers of the religion. Anybody who is born, anybody who is a, not a Christian, not a Muslim, not a Buddhist, not even a Buddhist, they call now Hindu. I mean, is a Hindu. They now call the Buddhists also are Hindus. Sikhs are also Hindus. And everything is absorbed into Hinduism. In fact, these were fighting, conflicting different religions. So they made very interesting stories. Like Vishnu was one major god. Vaishnavites were one major school of Hindu thought, and Shiva worshippers were another major school of thought. So they were fighting for more than two centuries. Kingdoms who followed these religions fought and killed for more than two centuries. But later, there was a merging of the whole thing. Now, there is, they divided the role of the gods. So there are three major gods. It's not a trinity, but there is a god named Brahma who is in control of creation. And Vishnu, who is in control of preserving everything. And Shiva, who is the god of destruction. Well, there are a lot of other gods. I mean, Vishnu's wife is the goddess of wealth. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon. But the moment you say that you don't believe, still, it's simply taken. Therefore, in many parts of India, if you say that I don't believe in a religion, if I am, I don't have a religion, you have no problem if you are from a Hindu family, generally. But the moment you start criticizing their rituals or making objections about their political hegemony in the name of religion, then you have enemies. For example, in the last uh, few years, there were four major non-believers, atheists, who got killed in India. Interestingly, all of them were from Hindu background. While a section of the Hindus say that all the atheists are also Hindus, all the four people who were killed, Narendra Dabolkar, Pansare, Kalburgi, and Gauri Lankesh, all were from Hindu background. They criticized the rituals, they criticized the traditions. Narendra Dabolkar asked for an anti-superstition law and he fight for a legislation. In fact, the legislation was finally coming and two days before that, he was shot dead. He was a close friend of me and he was uh, making a plan for my return to India back in 2013. And after his death, I postponed my return ticket. I came to Finland with a return ticket and that's postponed again at that time. So that's another story. But coming out of religion, sometimes can be very tricky in a huge country like India, though many Hindus would say that atheists are Hindus. If you criticize their rituals, their practices, then you have enemies. For example, if you ask for gender justice, then immediately the non-believer is an enemy. One good example is one of the biggest struggles in India in connection with the, the conflict of religion and non-belief was the right to enter the temple. The atheists were fighting for the right of the untouchables to enter the temple for their worship. It, it sounds like irony, right? But one of the greatest atheists in Indian history, Periyar Ivi Ramaswamy, was the leader of that struggle. 
why the rationalist or atheist movement took that point at that time was very simple. The atheism or rationalism in India is not only denial of God. It's not only denial of the theistic ideas, yes, broadly theistic ideas, but also it speaks for social justice. The foundation of Indian faith is the caste system. There's a hierarchical caste division in India. The Brahmins, the upper caste, were, according to the legends, they were born from the head of the, the creator god. And the Kshatriyas, the ruling class, came from the shoulders. And the traders, who came from the stomach, and Sudras, the, the, the workers, came from the feet. But still, that only amounts to a very small population of India, less than 15 or 17 percent. Still, the largest number of the people were considered untouchables. They were not even in the caste structure, in the Varna structure at that time. Later, the caste system came in the second century, and then there was a huge division. That was the foundation of the Hindu religion. How do you come out of that? Coming out of religion, living without faith is a highly complicated thing in India because you can leave your faith, but you cannot leave the religion because they will still insist that you are a Hindu. You cannot leave your caste. You can say that I left the caste, but you are still seen as a person of the caste. It's something like worse than the tribal ideas of Africa. Caste system is hierarchical. Some people are considered untouchable. Why they are untouchable? Because the gods decided so. You are an untouchable and you do certain jobs which are not very neat jobs. For example, if uh, a, a certain uh, caste can do only one job connecting with the skinning of the dead cows, that's a job for some people. You cannot come out of it. Earlier, if you do try to do any other job, you'll be killed. Even in many parts of India, the upper caste people would not tolerate if you try to move from your caste. And there are a lot of protection for people who are oppressed. So there is a quota of I mean, bringing them into professions and civil services and all. But still, there's a, lo there's a lot of protest against that also. So coming out of religion is not the major issue. But coming out of the faith structure is the most important thing in a highly complicated caste structure in India. So most of the people are struggling to leave caste structure also. And Fighting caste is so important in India and demolishing the caste structure is so important in India. Therefore, one of the major things, this is what I wanted to suggest, one of the major things that we found to fight caste system was to encourage mixed marriages. Marriages between people who belong to different castes. If people, and it is not normally possible, the families and societies would insist people to marry or find a spouse from your own caste only. If you break the caste orders, you can be caught by both the families and killed. Every year on an average of 300 to 400 people are killed by families, honor killing, because you have broken the caste barrier when you found a spouse. You are simply caught. The, the local communities will make a big meeting and maybe asking the father to ax down the, his own daughter. And many people do it in many states in India. His honor killings are very notorious in India. Caste is so deep-rooted, so deep-rooted, and it's not very easy to break. Many people thought, leaving the faith of Hinduism, how do you do it? In the last century, many people thought that one of the ways to leave this caste system and the leaving the faith, which is Hinduism, was to convert to other religions, to Christianity, to Islam. So also the Christian missionaries promoted this idea. You are untouchable because you are in Hinduism. You are not allowed to study because it was officially, legally, they were not allowed to study a century back. You are not allowed to enter into a school if you belong to a certain caste. There were long fights for the right of many untouchable castes to go to school. And later when it was approved by law, still the angry upper caste leaders would physically stop you. It was a story of a little girl who was taken by, after the law came, by a, caste, a leader of the social transformation. And the upper caste people burned down the school in protest because they didn't want lower caste to study because you are not allowed to study that's why you are kept down 
and you you are not allowed to come closer to a person 50 feet distance you have to keep when an upper caste person is coming somebody will be going ahead of him making some sounds and you all have to run to little bushes or run and in, jump into water if the upper caste person happen to see you you are the sinner it's a mistake it's a punishable offense and that law existed a century back and there's a huge struggle against that led by the then rationalists and atheists in india so it is fought for the rights of the untouchable sin in india fought for their rights to go to the temple because the atheists said that we don't believe in any religion or god or temple or anything but discrimination is something we are strongly against the fight for equal rights of all people beyond their caste beyond their religion beyond their gender or any other differences is one major part of identifying as a non believer in the large community that we have in india so the indian rationalism why we insist the term rationalism many people ask i mean popular names are free thinkers or i mean atheists so rationalism has a different history that history coming i mean of course it's coming from britain i mean burton russell was one of the initiators of the indian rationalist association it was his initiative that created the indian rationalist association he gave the name to the first president of the indian rationalist association rp paranjpai and then our major concerns were not only limited to uh, criticize the faith in a god because that is i mean not very big issue in india for many people that's only a major problem for the semitic religions for the hindu faith it's mainly the idea of discrimination coming from the faith that was the key the caste division is a creation of god moment you break caste system you are creating the 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 order of the gods or the the original idea of the gods that people should be divided and everybody should be busy with their karma the karma has a different meaning in english but in india it simply means that it's your destined job that's your karma and why you get that because what you have done in the previous birth you have done something wrong you didn't respect the brahmin properly therefore you are an untouchable obey the brahmin suppress and accept your slavery and then you have a chance to become an upper caste person in the coming birth so you suffer it because you expect a result by submitting this was the first major barrier we got to break so we encourage the rationalist movement even before my birth the rationalist movement in india started much before my birth many people think that i am the founder of the indian rationalist movement no it's not correct it was established before my birth and uh, this movement was very active uh, and part of the social transformation movement in india the temple entry struggle was led by the rationalist movement rationalists fought against the caste system and uh, we continued it my father for example he was even before he became active in his younger days before that also the rationalist movement was there in india and uh, the kind of social issues that we took included you know how we define is it's a kind of we identify people beyond all possible divisions based on caste religion gender or any kind of economic uh, status or any other kind of social divisions should not stop us understanding each other as equal persons so that's the ma- the moment you say that you believe in the equality of all people beyond caste you are rejecting the foundation of india's faith and that is what we have taken very clearly rejecting a god is very easy in india because that doesn't make any issue there rejecting the faith structure the foundations of the faith is the major issue and that's what we are focusing on in india it's a little bit difficult to understand for people who are familiar only with the the single god who created everything and there was kind of tradition with one revealed revealed book and all but this is a very complicated structure and so therefore the fight against that is also complicated so leaving religion and becoming a person without religion uh, is uh, the moment you say that personally i don't believe in a god still you can be a, a hindu guru you can have a saffron cloth and still you can be a guru and a lot of people would follow you and you can still say that i don't believe in a god in fact there are many gurus who say that they would not believe in any god i mean that is one part of the tradition of india but 
the moment you attack the foundations of this faith then you are re- becoming a real non believer so we believe or we try to do transforming the societies so it's something like if you if if for example if uh, the discrimination against the black community uh, in many parts of i mean united states even now if it's connected with faith imagine that if it's sanctioned by faith the people if people believe that the faith justifies that therefore it cannot be broken then the fight against racism would also become a fight against the faith that's precisely what is there in the caste system and caste is worse than racism so we also therefore we identify we are against caste system against any kind of racial discrimination or gender discrimination we clearly took a position as back as in 1940s that we stand for a society of equals equality and freedom and freedom is the key that freedom to leave any faith freedom to decide about your value system freedom to choose your partner freedom to choose your life your freedom that decides what you are so therefore i generally tell this key of the word freedom to people from other cultures and of course i mean one easily identifies the spirit of freedom in robert green ingersoll in united states i mean almost 125 years back i mean he has been active for i mean more than a century back he was active and changed transformed the whole uh, ideas of united states after the first you know the, of course jefferson and all were key leaders of the secular or free thought movement in america but later you can see that the kind of uh, puritans who went to united states of influence united states in favor of fanatic ideas and the second wave of free thought came with robert green ingersoll the key of robert green ingersoll's argument for he used the term agnosticism which is clearly i mean atheistic only i mean that was the word he used in in his famous essay why i am an agnostic he was speaking clearly as an atheist but he said the biggest value that we stand for and fight for and give our life for is freedom freedom and equality that's the key of non belief the freedom to choose your life your faith your way of understanding things and it's not just taking something i mean as a world view which is also important because the one of the major positions that the non believing community all around the world would insist on is the right of people to decide for themselves we stand with scientific knowledge science is the guiding light for us and there is no final answers everything is open and very fable and we keep on moving forward and every single day we are understanding the universe better and better and we are improving our medical understanding and we are improving our understanding about the universe with new inventions and discoveries and application of it in technology but on the same time the whole idea that we build up is based on another major thing that is not directly connected with science for example the values that are so important of t- our times democracy the idea of respecting others world views the idea of peaceful coexistence the idea of tolerance the idea of free speech the idea of free expression but it goes not only with atheism the moment i say that i should have the right to speak what i want what i think right i fight for it if anybody wants to keep his blind faith for something it's not disturbing other people i would say that theoretically he would also also have the right to keep his faith i would still fight against that and i would defend his right to go for that therefore the atheists and rationalists all around the world stand for the right of all people to go according to their conscience the right of people to have their own conscience is very important it's free thought is the freedom to think what you think right to think right and wrong and even if people think something not acceptable to scientific understanding the society should not be affected by that and the community should not be affected by that and others should not be disturbed by that and their life should not be threatened by that but if people have their find 
absurd ideas, no society or no government has a right to go and suppress them. If somebody wants to still believe that this earth is flat, you can have a flat earth society. We make joke about them, we make fun about them, but still nobody should be able to suppress them or arrest them and put in jail for that. The key of freedom, the foundation of the idea of freedom is very important. The moment you understand the, the core values of non-belief, you immediately understand that you are standing at the, the highest position that you can reach with the human civilization. You are standing along with the greatest ideas. You are standing not only on scientific attitude and scientific positions, you are along with science. Science is the guideline, but also you are with democracy. You are with freedom of the individual. You are with the freedom and rights of people. You are against all kinds of discrimination and you are any kind of arbitrary assumption of authority. You are thinking about a free society. So the, the whole foundations, I would not say that, I mean, we need not elaborate it in, in, in detail. Of course, we, every time we try to make it better and better, there was a, a humanist manifesto sometime back and uh, Joseph Levy has written an atheist manifesto. We have made a, a Italian declaration some years back. But still, what we have as a basic document is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The major attacks on civilization, major attacks on, on, on free thought, major attacks on people's rights, major attack on any kind of free expression, I mean, can be defended, even with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, though it still needs modifications and improvements according to the new levels of understanding that we have. Every year, every new day, our understanding is growing with scientific knowledge at one side, also about understanding our own value system. Some years back, we didn't have the clear ideas about the of rights of people in connection with their sexual freedom. For example, some years back, or sexual orientation, Alan Turing, for example, was, I mean, accused of us as a criminal, and he, he finally ended up in suicide. That was immediately after the Second World War. The end of 19, um, 1945, 1946, Alan Turing was one of the pioneers of the modern computer uh, and computronics, but he was I mean, identified as a person who was, he was a gay. And he was given an option by the British system at that time, either he should go for chemical castration or he should be penalized for that. He went for chemical castration. That was the punishment at that time. He could not cope with that and he suicided some years back. And later, the British society transformed its idea about people's rights, about defending their or orientations and live accordingly. And later, when the monarch officially apologized for the mistake. So this, look at this. I mean, this is in last half a century that our views have grown up further. It's still growing. Now about genders, we have furthermore ideas. In the last 10 or 15 years, people are changing their gender. The gender identity, then the, it's beyond the, the, uh, the idea of uh, your physical appearance, of your physical body, what you feel as you as a male or female or whatever it is, that you can decide and you can even transform. A lot of people are doing that. We didn't have a clear idea about this maybe 50 years back. So the value system still has improved. That's where the non-believing movement or the atheist movement or the rationalist movement is growing further. Our value system is growing according to the, uh, the, the, the humane way of understanding things or expanding our horizons of knowledge about our value system, we are transforming. We don't stick to any revealed value system. That's the most important thing, which is connected with the basic acceptance of the human right. And, and the idea is, I mean, of every single idea that we are working is getting modified. And our adapt adaptability to understand that and accept that and transform our worldviews accordingly is the key of the, the value system of the free thought moment.
So I would generally, I mean, I mix up all these words, free thought and atheist and rationalist always, because I have a very clear feeling in my mind that these movements are all the same, very clearly. The atheist movement and the free thought movement and the rationalist movement or the skeptic movement, to a great extent, this is all the same movement with different focus. Skeptic movement probably focus more on the paranormal claims and other things. Free thought movement focuses on the state and religion separation, or atheist movement mainly focuses on the belief system and our countering on that. The rationalist movement focuses equally on the social differences. I mean, this, but these all are pillars of one same big movement. Collectively, we can broadly say it can be a movement of the non-believers. Whatever name, I have no quarrel with any name. I would say that I am an atheist, I am a humanist, I am a rationalist, I am a skeptic, I am a free thinker. I don't find any difference. I share with all the values that the whole movement shares and that these all are important. This movement, this collective movement, which is known under different titles, according to historical reasons in different countries, it's a huge big moment. Now, before concluding this, I would bring my uh, focus on one small issue. When you leave religion personally, when you decide it's actually happening in your life, what the society speaks is a different thing, but what you feel, are you in a faith? Are you afraid of demons and spirits and ghosts and uh, divine orders or are you understanding the universe with your own conscience, your own understanding, your own humane value system and your own judgment based on scientific knowledge or you want to go with all this kind of old stuff. If you realize that you are on this side of the fence, then there is only one question. Have the courage to come out of it. Come out of it courageously. There is nothing to be afraid of. And when you come out, what you experience is something so wonderful. Because that moment, the fear is gone. The fear of the paranormal, fear of the God, fear, fear about the demons, fear of the uh, afterlife, everything is gone. You understand that you have only this life. You realize that you have to live the life the best way it's possible for you without troubling others making it possible as much as good for others also, but and you, 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 don't, you can enjoy your life without any fear of consequences after the life. Enjoy it fully. Celebrate your life and make the best out of it and use all possible scientific knowledge about medicines and health. Live a good life, a long life, by following modern medicines, evidence-based medicines. Understand the universe without fear and try to take a position that every knowledge that you have about the universe or scientific knowledge is verifiable and have, one should have an open mind to modify, improve with fresh knowledge coming when our horizons are expanding. Once you have that spirit, then when you are not the custodian of the final truth in your hand, but when you are humbled down with the reality that I know very little only, but I'm not getting into great conclusions about this universe. I'm open to understand. I'm open for verification. I'm open to study. I am open to understand the feelings of others. I understand the value of this life. I understand the equal rights of all people. I understand our peaceful coexistence. I understand that this life is meaningful here and now. Then you understand that you are not just living. You are fully enjoying the fullest possible life that you have exuberance. That's what you're having. Then. So celebrate this life. Enjoy this life. Love your dear ones. Laugh a lot and have confidence. Don't be afraid of the life after this. This life here and now. That's what you get when you are out of faith, out of religion. And that is something, one of the most promising things that you can gain. Not like a you promise about life after death, but you realize it the moment you break the imaginary chains that you are tied with. Bertrand Russell has a very famous position. Faith is something like a staff you are leaning on when you feel that you are weak and you don't have confidence. When you cannot address your problem, you lean on a staff, lean on a stick and try to get strength from that. 
But now you understand that there is no staff. You are just imagining only. You are leaning on an imaginary staff. You feel that you are standing on that. Just remove your hand. You are free. That's the key of the whole thing. You don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't need support of any kind of paranormal forces or imaginary gods or demons or anything. You have to live here and now the best possible life in the fullest way it's possible. That's what, you know, the, that's the key of living without religion. Look at all people who are out of religion. They, they may have health problems. They may have other problems like all other people. But look at their face. They are happy. They are trying to get the best out of their life. They are confident people. And their confidence is coming from one small thing. That they have to address their problems. There is no other God. There is no other I mean, faith or, or, or other forces there to help you. We understand our problems. We evaluate it. We, we mean so the person alone or along with friends or along with the community, together we discuss and we understand our problems and we find our solutions. For every problem, there is a solution and solution is here that we have to find and we have to address. Don't be afraid of anything. This is our life and enjoy it. That's the biggest fruit that you have to get when you come out of religion. If that's a forbidden fruit, take that forbidden fruit and enjoy it. Thank you very much. I welcome uh, Nina Sankari from Poland, uh, who is heading the, uh, the atheist organization as well as the foundation of one of the pioneers of the free thought movement in Europe. Maybe Nina should say in a few seconds, I mean, of course, she would speak later, but uh, maybe if she can speak her own personal experience of uh, coming out of religion or living as a non-religious person briefly to begin with. Please unmute and speak a few words. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you. However, I was not prepared. I'm not prepared at all to talk. I really came to hear you, Sanal, so and maybe your discussion. Uh, I can say to you very briefly, I had the, it was very simply for me to be an atheist, as every child uh, is born as atheist, I was too. And then I was born in an atheistic family. So it was absolutely uh, normal for me to, to be an atheist. Just in contrary, I was uh, very often surprised to see other people, my 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 friends, uh, to believe in such things uh, that for me uh, were completely unconceivable. I, I I could not understand. It was so irrational for me. So for me, I, I am not a hero. I did not overcome overcome something. Uh, it was too, uh, absolutely natural. However. Uh, in Poland, after uh, so-called um, democratic transition, uh, the Polish church received a really big, big role. It is a domination. So we have now church and state uh, alliance in Poland, and we have really a religious oppression in Poland. So now we are fighting the, the, the difference between this system and the previous one, so-called socialist, was that at that time our government, our authorities were uh, atheists and society not so much. Now we have the bottom-up movement uh, of secularization and even atheization of society and we are doing everything we can, I'm speaking about my organization, to accelerate this process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And also, I would share, announce that Nina is organizing a great conference towards the end of March, and I would be attending, and there will be other representatives, oh, uh, the, the international, international will be attending. 
we would give more information about that conference in the coming meetings also so that others who are interested could also join anybody willing to come to join us still possible but not too long but uh, the uh, famous uh, 80s of the world Richard Dawkins will be present so it is maybe an occasion you are all ever, uh, very very cordially invited thank you um, nina well thank you sanal sir and um, on this note uh, we can move to the participants now and i would want uh, everyone to speak about your concerns and genuine questions uh, provide genuine questions that come to your mind and um, i would also request every one who wants to ask a question on zoom uh, if you can just turn your videos on uh, uh, maybe maybe not only asking but maybe their own experience their own responses i mean that also can be shared because that's also important for all of us yes absolutely so i think for the beginning we have uh, salim with us hello I'm salim i'm yesterday i have attended the very same meeting coordinated by mr sanal adamnagar and uh, i think uh, in continuation of that i want to uh, talk express my uh, opinion and uh, i think the whole world actually uh, uh, we can say that all the institutions whether is a company is a school or hospital and everything is controlled by uh, the believers of any religion actually we are we the atheists are suffering even from the time we are getting married we are suffering when uh, after marriage of course at that time i am i am sure i was not 100% uh, or even 99% atheist i was I, having some belief and I, in a transition period but if, if i uh, get some sickness or if i commit some mistake or in jobs and everything they will say ah this is because of you, you are an atheist they will point out the uh, because of my atheism this has happened if, and also if, uh, i really know that one person has lost his job because he is an atheist and uh, they are saying the company told that because of his atheism company lost the profit uh, during my searching job when i went to bangalore actually you, know, you see my name is salim boss actually in short name i would uh, i would have written as um, salim pv and uh, many app uh, companies reject my application thinking that i am a muslim this is this was case in uh, i think in uh, 1992 now i think the feeling the caste or religious feeling of people has increased day after tomorrow there is going to be on big pongala uh, that would be participated by more than 20 lakhs women in uh, trivandrum and uh, i have to start because there won't be any hotel set up even the swiggy or um, somata they won't work because they cannot travel all the roads will be would be blocked and nobody can travel or any hotel can uh, cannot offer and also the, even during the education all students are hearing from they they start their education they are hearing everything about the religion actually my experience also when whenever i get some fever or like that my wife would have got gone to temple and pray for me because of, of course for him him he is an atheist but i am a believer like that that is my experience of course now i am a senior person i have enough money and i i need not for afraid of anything and now i am safe but um, for youngsters so um, they are really facing so many issues their jobs or education or anything else even schools they cannot raise even if they don't believe they can raise any questions then uh, they will be not around they will um, teachers will punish the exam actually yeah. simple issue even in kerala you can say the attitude of the present chief minister who was earlier criticizing um, safa now uh, he is somewhat favoring them earlier communist people were i know i was a uh, yes, short period i was in that communist party and almost all people were at this now if uh, they said that uh, these people should it means then their committee will be there won't be any people in the committee we have to strengthen ourselves 
we have to concentrate not only in meetings or this type of club house zoom or like that we have to venture into all what wherever now the uh, religious people are engaging we should also engage into that business or schools or like that at least help in the future generations them send um, their children to the this school or like that that is my personal opinion. okay i understand the position salim i mean let me uh, clarify one small thing there so you set one example that when you went for a job apply for a job there was a discrimination that you faced not because you were an atheist but because somebody thought you were a muslim there is a discrimination in our society based on prejudices sometimes it's religious prejudices sometimes it's racial prejudice sometimes it's linguistic prejudice sometimes it's gender prejudice there are a lot of prejudices that are existing in our society every single society you take you see prejudices existing so we have to develop a world view which is rejecting all these prejudices it's not only the job of the rationalist or atheist movement all people who are on the progressive side of the, our civilization should stand for this position and they should all try unitedly to end prejudices in india for example many communities are prejudiced in different places because of their just by your birth or by your name but not only religion if you belong to a certain caste you are prejudiced against yes. if you are if you are belonging to an untouchable caste which belongs to something like more than 60% of india's population you are underprivileged and you don't get a job somewhere even if you become a civil servant i mean you are not accepted by people you have read even the stories that an untouchable girl drinking water from a school pipe immediately the upper caste people wash the whole well with cow urine to purify it of course and they try to stop it because the prejudices are existing and these are coming from the past false beliefs so that's not a question of atheism or non belief or faith on the other side it's a general tendency in our society to have prejudices and that's something we are fighting against the gender prejudice there are people who are discriminated just because of their gender women were prejudiced for i mean till recently i mean till i mean very recently they were prejudiced on anything any single thing that you know you cannot you when you work equally you didn't get equal salary you were not even allowed to work on many sectors there was a lot of prejudices simply because if you were a, a woman so this all exist in the society and everybody thinks that i mean our certain position is the key for all prejudices a muslim would think in india that he is discriminated because he is a muslim an untouchable would think that because he is an untouchable he is prejudiced against a woman can think that uh, uh, there is a prejudice against them i mean but there are prejudices there are a lot of prejudices based on all these kind of things so what we have to do here is we have to there are laws that are against the prejudices there are laws to help us there are laws to support us so we have to use wherever it is possible the law on our side wherever there is a prejudice against communities there are prejudices if you are in northern india and living uh, coming from eastern side of india there is a prejudice against the eastern indians in many parts of the delhi university if somebody is coming from nagaland or places like that there was a prejudice i remember some years back i mean now i don't see that people from southern india were prejudiced against or when north indians are coming and working in kerala there is a prejudice against that i mean they are in bengal the biharis working there are biharis are a kind of a low caste people a lot of prejudices in this society so that's not only the atheist or rationalist movements issue that's a general issue and that existed for centuries and centuries and centuries and we are trying to transforming by political resolutions and political changes and uh, new laws and different ways we are changing it i mean there was slavery a lot of people were just discriminated because they were blacks because their parents were caught from somewhere in africa and brought as workers in america and these all exist the, all these prejudices exist and when we think that i mean anything that we want to i did if we think that that's the only prejudice that we have that's and secondly if people there is a lot of influence these religious organizations have because they have institutions but the answer is not making alternative atheist schools to counter it that's not the answer 
the answer is secularizing the schools if christians make schools okay now we should fight with them and make atheist schools again you are dividing the society every single school working under the law should have a system where there is no prejudice no student can be denied admission because of their religion and if anybody is running a school there cannot be any kind of religious persecution there and if that is there we have to fight it i you know i am in my 60s and when i was a young boy i remember when i was taken to a school by my parents i had a problem to join a school because my parents insi- insisted there's a column in the school admission form to mention the religion and caste and my parents insisted no he doesn't have a religion or caste he is a human being only the school said no but the, the rules say that you have to fill up this column so my father went to the higher authorities went to the court and fought they fought for that and finally i was admitted in the school and i became the first student in indian school records anywhere to enter a school without caste and religion not mentioned so there was somebody who fought for it and made a law when he when my father became the secretary of the kerala's rationalist association law back in 1970s he made a resolution to the government and got a government order later to officially permit to allow children to enter into schools without mentioning religion and caste now there are at least every single year more than 10000 students joining in kerala without mentioning their caste or religion that's how transformations come so the what i wanted to say is that sometimes when if you are a, a mixed marriage hindu or muslim together so if you have an illness and if your wife is a muslim imagine i mean it's, it's just a hypothetical thing she would say that because you are worshiping all these idols you have this problem you should worship allah won't she say that she would say that because she has her belief to impose upon you your parents are faithful and you are a non believer they want to impose their faith upon you but laugh at it smile at it and say that come on i have my faith i know what i want to do you have an illness they say that oh that's because you have not gone to this temple that's why you have an illness come on don't make all these kind of stupid ideas i know what is an ailment and if you don't know i can tell you but this is something which is a ridiculous idea you confidently address it and laugh at it and face it the way you want it that's don't be afraid of all these kind of criticism don't be afraid of all these persuasions against you don't be afraid of any kind of pressure upon you because of somebody wants to impose their faith or their religion or their idea or their gender supremacy upon you or their politics upon you there there are a lot of influence of politics of gender discrimination or caste uh, i mean discrimination i mean or religious discrimination there are many kind of things or world views many things are there that can be against you but if you are confident about your views stand by it insist on it and any kind of criticism take it in one year and throw it off in the other year and that's the way one has to address it any kind of discrimination of any kind of prejudices you have to address confidently that confidence you have to attain that's most important thank you thank you um i think we can move on to the next person now um we have matthew with us uh, matthew if you can unmute yourself and proceed how's yeah. that now yeah fine oh, okay thank you sanal nice meeting you nice seeing you and nice knowing you and as well as all the other participants i am in the united states eastern northeastern part of the country and um some of the things that i wanted to address a uh, few of them were mentioned by celine that the, the previous participant that uh, spoke um as you probably addressed earlier which was i have uh, listened to some of your lectures um the support system that the religions provide um from birth till death is one of the main reason why most people are reluctant to go to the mainstream with their knowledge and awareness of um as non believers many of my friends have acknowledged to me uh that they are just going there just because of tradition just because they want to be fellowship with their friends and they are born into it and right now i have been so am i for until a few years ago uh but that support system is still lacking and i can empathize with uh, uh, with um, salim on that one 
And one of the things that happens is, of course, as you probably addressed earlier, is birth, wedding, death, and so on. These are issues that the religions handle um, as a support system for most people. And that is because, as you probably know, um, the religion is a family thing. It is always born through family, through parents, most of the time. Very, only very small percentage actually jump from one religion to another. So if you're born to a Christian parent, which just like I was, then you'll be a Christian. If you're born to a Hindu parent, you'll be a Hindu. None of the, most of the people do not follow a religion just because because they have actually acknowledged, you know, uh, uh, acquired any awareness of any of the religions, but just because uh, their parents taught them so and they have been born into it without asking any questions. Um, the reason that, uh, by the way, I was uh, growing up in Kerala, just as you were, uh, when you were doing your master's, I think I must be must have been doing my bachelor's back in, uh, in Barami, Kerala. So, um, and back in the day, as you know, there is no resources available uh, to interact with anyone that has, uh, even for scientific knowledge, there was not much resource. I mean, you have to go to the library and read, and, and there is no internet, none of that stuff. Uh, so it was hard, because I didn't even know you uh, at that time, and I wish I knew. Uh, so that's the issue. And now it has changed ever since 2000, the new millennium come along, and things have totally revolutionized in terms of resources and knowledge that people can have if they wanted to. But unfortunately, most of them are tied up into this into the system of support system, and they are afraid of getting out of there. Um, and um, so there has there is a need for something of a networking uh, support system, at least a hotline, which is a simple thing to do for um, get all the available resources for like minded individuals. Um, not that we have to do any structures because existing structures will do just fine, just like you said, to do whatever we want to accomplish in life. And we have scientists from India that has come to the United States and UK and, and everywhere else that um, was brought up in religion but did not want to do anything with it, and they went along very well. They, in fact, meaning that they have studied and gained their knowledge, even with the existing system. So it's possible. All you have to do is to pursue that. Um, and um, uh, another thing that happens is uh, something similar to Salim mentioned is employment, which is an issue, especially in India, when it comes to referrals. Uh, uh, not referrals, referrals as well as references. Most of the time what happens is if you are going to be out of the community or out of the church and out of the uh, network that you already have established, it's very unlikely that any one of them will give you a reference, for example, or a recommendation or a referral. So that is an area that we can work on, uh, another area, which is sec my second point. In, in addition to the hotline or something like that for making available all the resources. Um, and uh, the reason that most of the time this uh, political dialogue is happening, what is called a um, self-interest uh, kind of politics, which is, um, you know, actually deviating most of the um, public discourse into a right-wing philosophy uh, everywhere all over the world, actually, not in the United States, actually, in particular, and in India, it's happening, and um, uh, that has to be addressed also in terms of the available resources and knowledge that people are blocking themselves from. In other words, they're actually lacking information by way of isolation, which is happening all over. They're isolating themselves into a block of, or what, he, what I call cocoon, cocoon, into their own shell, and they're unaware of what's happening. In fact, I have spoken to many of them, they have no idea what's happening, what happened in the last 20 years. No idea, none whatsoever. If you speak with them about what is going on, there is any reasonable person 
can know that none of all of the things that they have been taught is fundamentally wrong in terms in terms of being born into a religious faith and so on. Fundamentally, flat out wrong. Uh, everybody knows that. Even the religious people today knows that. I mean, Pope has acknowledged. I mean, they are they have been going through several changes, and he has issued statements regarding that. Uh, but that doesn't reach too many people. I mean, they are still caught up into this system. Now, I know that, uh, as you probably know, within 20, 40 years, uh, things are going to change. The new generation comes up and they are having, they're going to have more information than we do. Um, and uh, just like what's happening in Europe, all these other structures that, it, that we are talking about will be probably um, museums or something of that nature. That is true. Um, but in order to expedite this process, what we can do is to do certain things to counter, or not counter, but to have an alternated, uh, alternative um, support system, basically. That's my idea. And I, I, you know, I'm, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that, at least on the beginning scale, um, and because that is actually needed and everybody have a concern about that not concern it's not a concern if you are aggressive enough to pursue what you wanted to but no, everybody is different people may need something uh, people may need some resources to for example here um we don't have any kind of networking available in terms of uh, uh atheism there is a humanist association near, near me which is about uh i would say about 100 miles from where, where i am uh, and they're scattered all over. So uh, in, in America, it's, it's basically a religious Christian nationalist country, or they're trying to make it a Christian nationalist country, which is not going to happen. Uh, but so there is a support system that need to can help, actually, to expedite the awareness, actually. Yeah, thank you. I mean, one of the most important things that you said is the importance of a support system for those people who are facing issues in connection with the basics of uh, our, our normal social life, for example, the birth, the schooling, marriage, and all these kinds of things are so closely connected with the, the, the cultural positions that religions are taking, the, especially the community building. So that is one point which we have to seriously mm -hmm. focus upon, and that's a, a, it's a very good suggestion that you made, which we have been considering for quite some time also to create a support system, which we have developed in some places, but globally we need a kind of a big network of uh, information storage at one site and uh, I mean, a kind of a hotline where people can reach when there is an issue, for example, somebody has died and how to handle it, I mean, or somebody is ill and if there is a, uh, an issue in connection with that, these kind of things can be addressed if there is a well knit support system that is established. And that's something we have to work about and we should think further about that. I mean, we should be in touch again. And uh, I mean, please feel free to contact me. And I mean, I'll be also take your contact details. And I mean, like-minded people, we all should sit together and make a plan, a strategy to develop a network. We have developed one important thing, which is a, a new app we developed when we are trying to yeah. build kind of a networking information uh, supply system possible. So it's, it's in the making. In another five years, we'll be able to perfectly make it. I mean, with the communication system, which is effectively available to all of us. So this is a very good suggestion. I fully appreciate and support that idea. And we should go ahead with that. Thank you very much. I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm interested in uh, this kind of discussions. Yeah. So uh, my my question to you is, you know, uh, what you are saying, most of what you are saying, very, very obvious kind of thing, and you cannot contest it. But I have a different question to you, because this whole scientific uh, uh, scientific era is only as old as say 250 years or so. So in this period of time, we have uh, developed amazing technologies, uh, amazing technologies, and we are continuing to do so at an amazing pace, at an even more amazing pace. You know, they are saying it is exponential growth of technology, especially in IT field, singularity, and all the stuff which you are totally aware of. So the thing is that my question to you is that uh, is this all adaptive in the long run? For instance, uh, many prominent scientists such as Martin Rees. Martin Rees is the Royal, uh, Royal Astronomer. 
the Royal Astronomy is quite a uh, distinguished scientist and, uh, and he has written uh, very, uh, very important books, uh, like six constants, like in little mini books like that, I think. So anyway, his uh, contention is that there is a 50-50 chance of the humanity surviving this century because of uh, uh, anthropogenic disaster of various kinds, which all have a basis at their basis uh, the scientific developments. Uh, it could be a global warming disaster or will be disaster. It could be nuclear bomb explosion. It could be genetic invention. It could be so many things like that. All of that category. And many scientists, not only this uh, Martin Rees, there are other scientists also who are expressing similar apprehension regarding regarding the long term long term utility of science. Because you know it's, uh, the ants are not scientific. The the ants and the and the, the the many species, the millions of species which are surviving, which have very little scientific knowledge, but they have survived so many millions of years more than the human being. So this whole this whole scientific enterprise, whether it will be useful in the long run, in the long run, that is a very very debatable point, and we, humanity has no ex experience to quote from. To quote from, because you now the Earth does not does not have infinite resources, nor is it an infinite waste paper waste basket. So both ways we are we are constrained, and nature itself not doesn't seem to care whether human beings live or thrive or perish or whatever. It is quite it seems to be quite indifferent, and mathematical equation seems to seems to be the the thing that is underlying underbuilding all this uh, universe as a whole, universe and multiverse, whatever. The whole thing. So, in this context, now uh, my question to you is: uh, Do you really think that this uh, this uh, this uh, scientific uh, uh, era, whether it will be it will can sustain itself in the long run, given the constraints under which we live, we humans live on this earth, and uh, and uh, and 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 how powerless we are against this mathematical equations? So I wish to know from you. And also, if you can ask another question, um, there are a lot of changes, a lot of new inventions in the in the in the logic of uh, uh, in the law in logic itself. For instance, uh, cut to Gödel's theorems, uh, which have uh, proven that uh, any mathematical system complicated enough to hold the uh, contained uh, integers, it will either be incomplete. That is. Propositions can be explained, can be can be written down in that, which cannot be proved in that, or it will contain contradictions. So this kind of things have come up, and also third thing. Uh, uh, let's go uh, one by one because I cannot uh, hold all these uh, different questions with uh, all fine details because uh, that would okay. go for a one-to-one -one session for a long time. I'll take up the first question, which is a very important question that you asked, and I would like to answer that uh, whether the scientific knowledge would be keeping us, will that help us survive or will we perish? If the science, scientific information and scientific knowledge and the technology, if it does not guarantee survival, maybe, I mean, after 50 years or 100 years or 200 years or whatever it is, and if it all would perish, well, why should we actually go for scientific life, scientific way of things and survive and the Mosquitoes survived and uh, all creatures, I mean, that we know, survived without scientific knowledge, scientific studies, scientific exploration. So there is no guarantee for this. So what if everything ends? What's the meaning of this? Well, it's a very interesting question. But we have a different life than most of the species around. We have enjoyed a lot of things that they don't now. Because we, I mean, science, for example, I mean, you are right that that's a huge boost or jump or leap for science in the last 200 or 300 years and the pace of this leap is further accelerating i mean recently and i mean it's going further and further very fast but science is not only the recent leaps in the last two centuries the invention of the wheel was one of the major scientific innovation or the innovation of uh, for example that we can cross water over a woodlock was a great scientific knowledge at one time which transformed a lot of things. Or people studying to travel across seas several millenniums back. I mean, at least 2,000 years back, people have been traveling across ocean. That is all great scientific knowledge, how these vessels float at that time, they studied at that time. So science is not only limited to the recent leap of science, but also, I mean, the, the first man who 
made the wheel and I mean, made things moving efficiently. I mean, that was also a great scientific innovation. I mean, living apart, I mean, that's on the principle of what is scientific knowledge. The possibility that this uh, whole civilization could collapse its own weight and therefore it's not very sustainable to go for, go for science. We can live just a natural life because there is no guarantee that this would survive is one way of seeing things. There are many people, not very many people, who go very close to nature and reject all the scientific innovations and technology in their life. And there are, I mean, islands in many places. I mean, I've gone when I've been in, in Poland, I think, I mean, I've gone to, I've seen a, a, a small community living in a small secluded place who would reject everything that is from the modern way of life. And they make their own little fire and make their own food. And I mean, there are, I know other communities who would live on berries in the summer and I mean, frozen material uh, kept in, in ice in winter. Okay, people can live like that. People can be hermits. They can go to forest and live uh, as communities there. So many people opted those kind of lives, but not much people. The number is very less. They have their freedom to reject all technology and go and live like, as a hermit and reject all modern things. And I mean, it's their option. But imagine there is a nuclear holocaust and everything is gone. But we can also try to avoid it or to confront it or to overcome it. But if it goes, where it goes, but till that moment, we have to live the life, the best life possible. And we have to find ways the possible collapses. Or for example, if a comet comes and hits, now we know our Earth. Now we know, for example, we can see or understand such things much in advance. And we can even try to stop it. So our science and technology is not only helping us to improve our living standards here, but also to stop many potential dangers that could bring an end of the whole civilization. So that is science and technology is growing in a very fast pace, as you said. For example, if the earth is not livable, Perhaps, I mean, after a, a century or before even that, people could even think of moving to other planets. I mean, there are many things that are possible. It's not only that our life standard is improved, but also it's a fight for improving the possibilities of survival against any possible threats. We have surveyed great wars. We made all these weapons. We have made nuclear power I mean, weapons and all, but also we studied to survive. We, I mean, like... The ancient people studied to survive the floods, avalanches. We would survive, we would try to survive, and that is how scientific knowledge should go forward. Not only to improve our living standards, not only to improve the day-to-day -day life technologies, but also to address big possible dangers. So, but still, if there is some, I mean, unwise person using a nuclear weapon and damaging everything and everything is gone, then it's gone, we can't do anything. But that should not stop us going further and going to make it better and making the value system better and better and our life standards better and better and making the possibilities of freedom and making our life in, the, in a better way to enjoy the best way possible. So that should not be, you know, that fear should not stop us. Because earlier, if you remember, I mean, in history, we have a lot of people believed that there is a kind of end of world. There could be a great deluge coming. There could be a great fire coming. There could be a final collapse of everything coming. And people expected that, waited for that. But every time these kind of predictions or, I mean, kind of revelations of people, everything has been surveyed. But even if real threats that could come from comets or, or some other things or some epidemic or pandemic or whatever it is, we surveyed many things. We will try to survive and we will improve our capacities to survive it. And we have to keep on doing it so that we are able to face any possible consequences. And if you fail, well, we face it, we go with it, but that, does, that should not stop us doing anything. Thank you. Actually, uh, one thing I'm, if, I'm, if I may say something, yeah. uh, one thing I'm observing is that uh, your, all, your, all your talk is generally very anthropocentric. You seem to think that human beings are special victory and a special place in this universe. No, 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 no. <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm not anthropocentric. I mean, of course, when we speak, we speak about where we stand. 
but that doesn't i mean it should not stop us thinking in a very different direction absolutely not i am open to think in all possible ways and I, but all the same we as humans as a community we all think about our so if there is a flood coming i would think about the community around me who are facing the flood so i am at that time centric about that community at that time that's quite natural the other ways we will be able to collectively face that issue so when we have to address it in a very different way i mean such a situation comes of course i mean we have to think in a different way but every time i am i am generally i am a very positive person i mean having enormous confidence but all the same i mean i am not afraid to see any kind of consequences for example a complete a collapse of everything and the whole earth goes off fine science and technology should try its level best to stop it and if we fail we fail and then again i mean everything will start if anything is surviving but uh, that should not stop us doing things and enjoying our life thank you uh thank you and uh, so uh, now we have ratish kk with us um, if you could unmute yourself and proceed yes sir, good evening uh so uh, i see that uh, our 2011 uh, census india has declared only 0.24% of population to be non believers and uh, we know a lot many people uh, doesn't have faith in religion and all those things we have but it now comes to the, our government papers i feel it's mainly because of the present situation in india especially because of the reservation the people enjoy i think more than 60% of the people population enjoy reservation so if they want to uh, on the deny the faith but they leave the faith also they mm-hmm. never the want to leave their religion and caste mainly because of the reservation uh, reservation which government to, uh, oh and give to them so as for the european countries i, I don't think in india is uh, since the reservation continues we won't get a correct figure if you, if you do a census again i think uh, next year or something uh, again the government is going to the census thing so don't you think that this reservation is a discrimination among the people or they are not getting equality uh, so what do you take on this sir yeah uh, ritesh the question is uh, on the interest of the getting the correct figures of uh, the non believers uh, should we stop reservation or if it has dis- demerits therefore we should stop it these are two different questions so to get the correct figures of uh, uh, non believers you have been expressing like the concern about not getting the correct figures it's only 2.5 as per the government records let me come take up these two issues separately number one the figures in the state sometimes are very interesting for example the euro uh, i'll take the example of finland one one good example euro barometer says that i mean all the scandinavian countries 80% 78% 75% these are these are the number of non believers and euro barometer is done by european union officially and it's based on a special survey beyond the national uh, control and that is one of the most reliable things which all multinational corporations take their policy make their policy decisions based on euro barometer but it's not only about faith but also about the living standards their value system a lot of things are taken into consideration it's a huge study that they are making euro barometer is a reliable source of information about the faith culture living standards their views of life a lot of things including faith so euro barometer very clearly says that it's a huge high number and the, the people who are faithful are very few in the nordic countries or switzerland or japan i mean all these countries are netherlands i mean all these countries have a, a huge number of non believers around 70 to 80% okay but if you take the official figures take in finland for example it's a uh, still maybe the the non believers could be 40% you know the reason everybody is taken as a member of the church by default if the parents are in that religion so you have to officially sign a document to come out of the church to be in the government record to be out of the church therefore the, the rationalist organizations in finland some years back they made a request to the government at the time to make it easy for people to leave officially the religion because you cannot make an application go there and send them the church people will come and request you no 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 then the burial is easy the funeral would be done by us and it, therefore you remain in the church and they will pre and argue for this but now the 
the movement's uh, efforts have been successful, the parliament approved it. Now there is a website. You can go and you can click, uh, you can identify yourself with your credentials, and then you can click to leave the church. You are in the church by default because your parents have been in the church. So you can click there. And once you click there, it has a reconfirmation required after two weeks. You can they, they be asking you again to reconfirm your decision after two weeks. Then you are out of religion in all records. So that is the easiest way. And you know how people are responding to this? Finland is a country with a very small population. It's only 5.4 million people here. But uh, the number of people who are officially signing this document and leaving the church, it's 10,000 every year. And the, the percentage of people who are leaving the church is also growing. And officially also, now the majority has left the church and it's still going on. But the, the Eurobarometer is the most reliable information, which is not influenced by these kind of things. In India also, the census does not have a position to ask, what's your faith? Do you consider yourself a faithful or part of religion? There is no question like that. It only asks your religion. There is only one, there is another option, a person who is an atheist. Okay, even if it's 0.25, imagine 0.25 is something like half of the entire Sikh population of India. Imagine that. Or almost, half, uh, I mean, more than 50% of the Jain population of India, even in that. But the re most reliable information is not India census. You know, in India census, you know that my family, my parents, were declared atheists. I mean, very, very well-known story everywhere. But till 1970, in the district where they lived, there was not a single atheist in the census. Somebody will come, the school teachers will come to make the census. They will ask the name of the person. Sometimes they don't even ask. I mean, find a name and they decide it's a Hindu or Christian and they take and go. There, there was not even a column for that earlier. That is how it was. But uh, Gallup is making one of the most authentic and reliable information. Because if you want correct information, that is taken seriously. Gallup is making different kinds of surveys. And that's one of the most authentic information sources about all these kind of things. They're making every 10 years an, an elaborate study on many countries, including India. And that is where we have seen that it was 7% in, in 1991 and 9% in 2001. And 2000, by 2011, it has grown to 13%. And the projected figures for the 2021 is something closer to 20%. It's not clear yet. It will be coming only. But uh, what I wanted to say is that the question is how many people are there or not. That's not very important. Even if it is 20 persons or 50 persons, are you standing with your ideas and your worldview? And if you think something is right, you have a right to speak your position. The Swarashti or Parsis in India, their numbers are only thousands. What does it make? If somebody is a Parsi and he thinks that he's a Parsi, he should be a Parsi. And the number of people, how many people are there in one position is not what decides its quality. But on the other side, the figures that are projected by the government is not correct. Gallup is the more reliable thing is what I was suggesting, number one. Number two, the, that's regarding the figures. And if you go to, for example, another example is Iran. Iran, the official position is it's 100% Muslims there. Not 100% Muslims. I think a small number is uh, the, some worship, the Saratustras the, the, are there. They are, I think, 1% or 2 but the 99% of the people are Muslims as per the official records. But Gallup has made a study about that. And they, there they came out with a very shocking figure. More than 50% of the population of Iran would not want Islam as their religion. They want to come to freedom. And Iran was very angry. Now you see what is happening. People are on the street. They don't want Islam. They want to reject Islam. They want the right of women to be celebrated. And they're taking away their hijab and I mean the, the struggle is still going on at least uh, it has at least survived several months with uh, that kind of a vigor because the non-theistic movement was a hidden thing a suppressed thing it's, that was a repressed community Saudi Arabia you have no, no idea because if you are declaring as an atheist and if you are a citizen of Saudi Arabia naturally you get a death penalty so therefore you cannot speak about it that you know that these are figures we cannot really rely upon okay Anyway, the number of people who are leaving religion is growing systematically in all open societies in the whole world, not only because of the work of the atheist and rationalist movement, but also because of the, the growth of science and technology and information technology and people are exposing to knowledge and ideas. And earlier, as uh, some people earlier mentioned, I mean, you didn't know many things or it was not available to you. 
now if you have a mobile phone and internet connection you are exposed to a wide variety of knowledge and uh, unthinkable things that you earlier could imagine you get a lot of things you can think about things and you can uh, you know understand and see a lot of things and you you get a new world of knowledge that has opened up a lot of things and this process is going to accelerate further only therefore the people who are leaving the religion everywhere every single country in the whole world where things are not suppressed it's on the on the side of leaving the religion even not only our were i mean claim but even the church leaders everywhere are worried about that the religious leaders are everywhere worried that people are leaving the religion the faith is a major concern of all these people look at the annual statement of the bishops conferences they are speaking about people leaving the faith recently there was a bishop in in southern part of india in kerala where christianity has a predominant influence that people are leaving the faith and our boys are not getting any any uh, brides there because people are leaving the faith and going to they are leaving out of the religion for their relations and uh, their partners and i mean everything is collapsing for them but all the same that is not the, the major issue the issue is we should have the right to speak what we want number two about reservation reservation is something which is a very tricky question reservation is the quota system in india uh, aimed at the repress people over the centuries 120 years back many of them were not even allowed to go to school or walk on the streets or if they come in front of a person who is a, an upper caste person he would be beaten to death those kind of situations existed at that time these people were to be integrated in the society students from many communities were not even allowed to go to school it was legally banned that they study that was the situation and from there there was a necessity to change it a lot of people still now the aborigines of india i mean the scheduled tribes and all are not no nowhere closer to any kind of civilization or education in many parts of india so this has to change but there is a friction at a different level not at this real oppressed people but the the so called elevated communities who are closer to the the so called upper upper caste communities they feel that there is a conflict of interest because the opportunities are limited their engineering college seats limited and some I mean, of these guys gets a reservation and i don't get the reservation therefore i feel offended there is a social conflict this kind of social conflicts are part of any kind of efforts for transformation this has to be addressed studied closely and any kind of social groups that has actually came out from the oppressive situation they should be excluded from this list and it should be modified still there should be an effort to the really down trodden i mean to be taken up so but if anybody has any community has gone out of this this situation they should be eliminated and this list should be improved in another way i would always feel that there should be other ways to understand social deprivation than the caste if we can identify other ways to understand the social deprivation and oppression that people faced how many generations there was no education in your family or what kind of schooling that you got what kind of jobs your father was doing you can ask a lot of different questions and that could be one way of identifying thing but till such a new identifying method is available to identify the deprived people there is no other way but to continue this but the actually elevated people actually benefited people should be excluded from this list at least for now and there should be a new way of evaluating the social deprivation but that's a different question altogether thank you ritesh uh, sir can i ask one more question please 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 uh, sir uh, okay uh, uh, for what support system we uh, provide for in india especially in india context to people who are willing to uh, leave religion or a faith in europe you have a website where you click and you can uh, remove they get automatically removed from the church in india what support system we can suggest or currently we have for such uh, thing i am asking especially for an organized religion like islam and christianity there are two kinds of you know when people speak about support system for, for example earlier christian missionaries were converting people people ask what benefits we will get when we convert to christianity so then you will get milk powder regularly or you would get uh, or this kind of uh, support system on the benefit side is something which is immoral because you cannot influence people or help people with monetary benefits for changing their views that's immoral and incorrect and even illegal people are changing their positions and views because of their choice their option 
but there are a lot of real issues i understand what you are asking for example people who are leaving islam they have a real threat of their life because muslim communities in many places are very intolerant when anybody leaves the religion the family is even try to kill them off because leaving faith is a murtad is uh, something to be killed according to the faith therefore in such situations if you are in a dangerous situation there are ex muslim communities now we have established in many places and uh, we should if there is a crisis in connection with security when you leave a religion or a community or a, or a structure which is more oppressive you should contact the concerned people in the rationalist movement and uh, there should be some kind of arrangement there should be protection from police or you should be moving from that place to some other safe place that is where the suggestion made by mr matthew vergi is become very important here we should develop a support system depending on the kind of requirements that we have for example islamic uh, community is uh, sometimes very very intolerant especially in certain sects of islam if the family members are leaving the faith we have the example of one farooq who was uh, open out against islam and came out and his own brothers took initiative to stab him to death this kind of things happen but this also happens when you marry from a different caste if you are in haryana or uttar pradesh the kha panchayat will punish you because people are intolerant if you are in pakistan there can be honor killing if you marry somebody if your daughter marries somebody whom you don't like the parents would kill the daughter those kind of intolerant approach is not only coming from the faith angle but also from the kind of patriarchal system that we have been following for a long time so there are so many different social issues now seems to be connected with faith but it's not only connected with faith but because of the social system that in in many parts of the country that we are facing so therefore there are legal protection for everybody for that you can go to police that's the most important thing but sometimes even police would not be helpful there should be community support there should be strategic support there should be legal support there should be legal aid people who want to leave religion and marry for example or live together whatever it is and then if there is an opposition from the families there should be of course there is a legal support system but there should be uh, a, a kind of social support system that we need in kerala we have an intermarriage association if you remember so i remember my parents were very active in that organization if people were in love and the family is opposed they run to our home at that time so they, they our family would protect them get their marriage registered and they would sometimes stay there for one or two weeks and then a house is taken on rent and they move out i mean this was a regular practice i remember at least 200 couple coming to our house and getting married and going away i mean all of them like family members for us so but some structural establishment we require perhaps in every state there should be a hotline number and there should be people equipped with all these fundamental issues like if you are attacked by a conventional religious community or fanatics at one side if you want to if there is uh, some kind of social support system required there should be one telephone number you should be able to reach and somebody should be there who is well equipped with information and contacts to help these people that's a very good suggestion that mr matthew vergis has said and we have to work on that we have been thinking about that but uh, that also would answer your question that is thank you very much as see from yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so I, i'm a muslim so definitely i do have a objective no, i do have, have an objective moral ground so for me i do have right and wrong but you know for you as i can understand and i'm here in the room for you know for a few minutes so i am listening so what i can understand you want the social you know system but you you have a subjective opinion so when you say you do have a subjective opinion which is not grounded with anything then definitely that is only subjective for you and that is non principal for me like you know i'm not sharing your values so when you want to impose your values that is subjective whatever you are saying till now that is completely irrational for me because you are not saying based on based on something but as you are saying it is based on science in a sense but the problem is that science do not give you judgment it cannot give you judgment it only gave you the data so it can show us you know like some observation so if if you want to make your own made up thing and that will be different from others then again that is subjective so the problem what i can see from you know, from as i can understand there is no objective moral values you are holding and if there is none then whatever you are saying that is not logical in a sense Absol- you are you are absolutely right 
uh, the the whole rationalist community in the whole world is not for any objective moral value because there is no moral value that is objective because every moral value is subjective and changing from time to time from period from locality from time for example for mohammad marries a girl who is underage in present context that was not immoral at that time when he marries a girl of 6 years and starting living with her at 9 years the community in arabia at that time did not find it immoral but at this moment anywhere in the civilized world that is immoral right so the morality of those time, listen now now you have to listen you know now uh, this is my turn now so the morality of those times when mohammad lived and the morality of our times are different that is decided by it's a it's a subjective position a subjective value system that existed at that time another subjective value system existed at that time at the present time so if anybody for example marries somebody at the age of 6 or start living with the person at 9 years for example in india there will be a criminal offense charged against that person why indian criminal system is based on the new value system which is subjective for a person who would defend the value system of those times so every value system so the the, the position that the rationalists have is there is no value system that is eternally valuable for all times in all places for example in egypt you know the story of cleopatra cleopatra's time in egypt people the and the especially the royal family they married their own brothers cleopatra married her own brother but our own value system now would not accept nowhere in the world such a value system exists now why the value system of those times at that time of history and the value system that we have are different because that is what we call subjective it is subjective value system is evolving and improving for example in uh, in america i mean some 200 years back slavery was part of the value system it was justified now the what's the value system slavery of any kind is bad and not acceptable our value system has improved so value system is growing and our world view is developing accordingly our value system is expanding and it includes a lot of things freedom was not a value system value earlier any time none of these uh, abrahamic religions speak about human rights as a value that's a value now universal declaration of human rights is one of the foundations of modern value system these are all subjective yes you are true if you are thinking that we are not following your value system it's a different kind of value system we are speaking therefore you feel that we are trying to impose upon you sorry we are not imposing upon you you are you are not invited to this value system if you don't want you are you, it's your option your freedom you can still keep whatever value system you want so long as you don't break any law so don't so long as you don't break any official laws in in your country your whatever value system you keep you are you are welcome to keep remain there nobody is forcing you nobody is imposing upon you nobody even welcoming you to come out if you don't want if you want you are open to come to the world where two three major values which none of the religions would celebrate thus those, those include equality of all people equality of all genders that's one value system that we maintain so equality of people beyond their caste religion gender economic standards and all these kind of things the second thing is the idea of freedom then the it's also connected with the free expression the right of people to have free expression freedom of speech these are the value systems which you can feel subjective but we stand for so if you don't feel it comfortable come on please don't come into us come with us remain there you can remain in the 7th century you are not forced to come to 21st century thank you thank you uh, now we have uh, george with us on clubhouse um if you could unmute and proceed george um yeah this is uh, you know from some of the speakers you know you can understand that people are not understanding the value systems you know uh, <laughs> the value systems are, are written 500 years or 1500 years back or 2000 years back cannot match anything now um that that somehow people people feel that the value system is you know a, a religion or a um you know religious teaching are needed is needed to understand the value system that is that is somehow you know it is ingrained into the 
the the mind of people i don't know how we can actually shift that thinking uh, you know one common thing which i usually tell is you know right now it is acceptable to kill animal and consume their meat for example but there are some people like brahmins they don't do that according to their value it is it is kind of illegal right uh, but according to our value my value it is it is normal and it is okay but years from now you know when lab grown meats are popular and uh, you know there is no need to call um, you know raised animals to consume their meat probably it becomes a uh, the value becomes more of grammatical value of uh, you know not killing animals or something like that um, people may become uh, start becoming consuming more lab lab raised meats um, that's also a possibility in the future that is what i usually tell uh, as an example i'm done speaking yeah thank you heri that's a very interesting and good point that you said value system for example eating eating meat for example there is a value conflict which i personally feel many times i've said it many times i like meat i i like excellent uh, preparations of all kinds of meat and fish and everything but when an advanced mammal is killed though we are not seeing it for my food though that's necessary there is something that pinches somewhere and if there is a scientific solution to address that for example if you can clone meat as it's already developed in in switzerland and in in singapore and if you can get correct meat not uh, alternative vegetable based meat but you can if you can print meat from the same meat that's quality meat that can reduce for example the whole animal husbandry business and rearing animals for eating can be reduced and that would save really a lot of uh, the food grains going to keep them up so that these are moral solutions or that can come up in 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 the future that's that's something that's how value system change and secondly about the uh, the the vegetarian habit of indian brahmins again that's a very subjective interesting question as you may know for example the gadwali brahmins they eat meat i've seen it i mean for example i have some friends who are from the gadwali area and from the brahmin community and it's very common that they eat lamb it's very very popular there and if you for Br- bengali brahmin they would eat fish fish is vegetarian for them i mean but if you come to the other part of uh, the country like southern india i mean it's not only brahmins but the whole the kind of sanskritization process like uh, ms rinivas who should would say that people want to be brahmins so therefore they try to imitate what are identified with brahmins so you become a vegetarian to show that you are elevated in the caste system i mean that's a kind of process which is a by product of the caste hierarchy and all but i personally i am a meat eater and i enjoy my steak perfectly and i mean i really feel that that's an important thing that i need but this question can be addressed if that's a moral issue which our future generations will identify we would find a solution by reproducing meat from the same steak again i mean if that would be a great solution for many things that is that that's one of the ways that our value system would improve and change and modify by itself good good point hari thank you very much uh thank you sir and um, i'm i believe there are mo- no more questions yeah it seems uh, it's a very interesting session with a lot of people coming and going and a lot of interesting questions and discussions i mean some of the questions were i mean on the birth of little intolerance but all the same we could see and understand their position i'm very happy that uh, asif uh, spoke about his position also i mean uh, but that's how discussion should be there and we'll continue keeping on this discussion over and over, over again please subscribe to the rationalist youtube channel and also download the rationalist app mr matthew i mean let's be in touch and let's think about the practical way of making a, a way of a network supporting all around the world for people who require them thank you very much 